Okay, so um, so during my time at PwC, I was lucky enough to do the uh, one of the uh, biggest global survey uh, a year ago. So we interviewed 2,000 uh, company executives around the world from the nine industry verticals. So basically, you want to understand uh, what's the business appetite with the IoT. Uh, we call it we call it industry 4.0. What does it mean? Is the uh, industry revolution for the next one? Basically, because IoT enabled that, and also the digital, obviously. Um, so Based on those uh, survey, um, we found out the numbers is around $907 billion of annual uh, digital investment uh, committed annually uh, for uh, the particular year of 2016-2017. And um, they expected also uh, surprisingly two years of the ROI, which is a return of investment for the uh, AU and Singapore region, which is wow. Um, if you're in a business, two years ROI is fantastic. Um, and also, that's a, uh, the uh, research available uh, out there. Um, if you Google my name, I actually uh, put the uh, research there as well on my website, so you can download it for free. The result of the uh, of the uh, research there, um, based on the IDC, um, they say 30 billion things by 2020. So what does it mean? So it means the industry 4.0. We're in the tipping point here. So if you understand about Moore's law, um, the only way that we can go from here is just like exponentially. Going, going on. So, um, out of interest, anybody here actually work with IoT stuff? Maybe. It's better than I expected. Um, so, the number one thing around IoT and actually making this stuff meaningful is getting it ubiquitous in everything. So, you need it cheap and you need a lot of it. And I mean, a lot. Um, a, a, the simplest example that I can come up with quickly is the seats you're sitting on. Uh, if you can get all these seats internet enabled, uh, you can start tracking things like where people like to cluster in seating. And now that seems pretty simple and you think, well, what the hell do I want to know that for? But if you're an events organizer, that's a pretty important thing to have. You start running lots and lots of events, you start to know where people sit on a regular basis. Uh, that's the sort of thing that's going to change how you build these sorts of events. So, you can't do that unless you can get a really, really cheap, really, really easily enabled device into every single seat. And you certainly don't want to build much in the way of infrastructure. Uh, you want to be able to get that to talk through somebody's cloud to do all of that processing and then start generating some reports for you. Uh, you want to be able to use pretty bog standard application developers who can write a regular old Angular front end to represent all of those seats and tell you with a heat map or something of that variety where people are sitting at any one moment. And if people start getting up and wandering around, you know, why are they doing so? Um, and then you can start to travel that on and start correlating it with other data. So for instance, if people in this room are starting to send tweets, you can start correlating people who are tweeting with certain areas of the location. If there's photos coming out, where's the best spot to start taking a photo? That's the sort of stuff you can start to think of if you can get enough devices talking at the same time. You need to get that density. Uh, knowing where one cow is is kind of useful. Knowing where 5,000 head of cattle is is a lot more useful. Uh, knowing that you know on a regular basis a whole bunch of them get stuck in a certain location and die, that's really, really useful. So these are the sort of stats that you can find if you can just tag enough things. Um, what cloud platforms do is let you not have to pay for the usual millions of dollars of infrastructure you would have to fork out for to be able to do that. So most people here, I'm assuming, have some sort of connectivity through to the IT industry, like servers, infrastructure, storage, networks. Um, what Azure or Amazon will let you do is basically not have to hire any of those people. No network guys, no server guys, no infrastructure guys, no storage. If you need to store you know, 50 million rows of data a day on all of those devices that you're tracking, you can still do that and just pay by the app. That's the sort of thing that the cloud services are providing that you can do in the past. So, uh, what are these? Uh, what are the cloud platforms actually providing you? Uh, it's really boring um, and a fair amount of marketing bullshit, to be honest. Um, so, most of the IoT interfaces are little more than information gateways. They receive some sort of API call, they process that simple piece of information, and then pass it on to something meaningful. So, if you have uh, to continue the analogy, these seats uh, confessing where everybody's sitting, 
all that they're going to do is send some sort of JSON string, uh, which is literally just a text string. It might have something as simple as the seat number. It sends it through to Amazon or Azure. The API gateway collects that information based on some sort of query uh, or other identifying information and sends that through to something in the back end. Uh, the, the Azure version, but it's going to send it through to something like a serverless Lambda function and say, hey, here's some information I need you to process. Uh, it might stash it into a MongoDB in you know, tens of millions of rows of uh, NoSQL data that then you can use a Hadoop engine in the back end to process. Uh, it could send it through to EC2 compute. Uh, it could just simply store it in an S3 bucket. But all of these back end services are available to you. Uh, without having to invest much of anything, the IoT service is really just a simple gateway mechanism to get the device data through to something to process it, and then if it needs to, get it back out to another machine. So if you are more in a commercial space and you need to start doing things like having other devices take actions, uh, it could be as simple as rocking up at your house and having all of your lights turn on. Something about your car is going to talk to the internet, it's going to acknowledge that based on a GPS signal you're in a location. It tells Amazon Internet of Things, hey, my car is at this GPS location. That signal is then going to get sent over to something like a Lambda function or another API gateway. All the lights in your house are constantly polling out if you want to actually have it secure instead of waiting to listen. So they poll out to the Amazon Internet of Things and say, hey, is the car here, is the car here, is the car here? Yes? Okay, turn the lights on. It's that simple. That's all of those IoT gateways. That's what they're providing. So it's, it's, it's a really similar platform. If you can, uh, if you see the uh, the, uh, the typically uh, reference architecture here, so you have your device gateway. So Microsoft called it cloud gateway. So really, what is a cloud gateway? Is basically enable your potential investment or your existing investment. You can even leverage your machine to machine communication that you probably bought from 1970s in the industries. And you can uh, do the uh, bi-directional uh, communication to the. Uh, uh, you can do the stand up uh, gateway. Why there is like a uh, potential dot 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 gateway there. Basically, what happened is this nineteen seventy kind of machine. They can't really talk in the HTTPS. You can't deploy certificates there. But however, if you can deploy some kind of a uh, the machine gateway there, they understand the machine communication, which is what you want to use uh, uh, AMQP or other uh, methodology of the uh, communications there of the machine to machine. And then from the gateway, the device gateway, you can um, then they do a bidirectional communication to the cloud gateway there. And then behind the cloud gateway, it's really on three uh, kind of function or three kind of domain there. The first is the, uh, to enable the device connectivity. That's why cloud gateway and device gateway there. And also the, uh, the middle bit is the interesting bit, which according to Dave, uh, there's a million dollar investment there. It's basically all the processing and uh, all the analytics and management there. Or you want to throw some fancy bit, you can throw some machine learning there or Cortana uh, that can talk to the Power BI, for example, for the executive. For example, one of the, exe the executive I want to know when my wife's going home from the grocery. <laughs> so you can deploy there. <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad idea, right? And then they uh, come up with the, uh, in the morning in the Power BI, oh, during this time is the busy hours at, the, uh, at my home, for example. So, and, the, and then the presentation layer is really to enable uh, your business uh, con uh, connectivity. Maybe you have some connectivity back to uh, um, SAP. Probably you have a connectivity from existing investment to, uh, to CRM or um, other part of CRM. <laughs> a Dynamics, for example, or 365 or Power BI. Then that's really the, uh, the function of that, uh, of that bit. So, um, so what's the difference, really? Uh, it's really the same, so if, when, when David's talking about the S3, so you can put that in Azure, which is basically a blob storage, and the analytics you can use also the big data, uh, Hadoop also, and you can use Azure Machine Learning instead of, for example, AWS Machine Learning. And, um, and we have uh, some of the uh, identity and registry stores there. It's really important. All the usual things about cloud platforms uh, that we all use, some of the things in IoT, uh, leverages that have really made it a, a thing that we can do today. I sort of see there's two main things that have enabled this. Uh, maybe three. But uh, one, the devices have gotten dirt cheap. In the past, it just wasn't feasible to be able to roll out enough devices to make it meaningful, in, particularly in the consumer space. Um, 
Uh, has everybody seen the, the pictures, I'm pretty sure you still can't get them here, the Amazon buttons to order like Ben and Jerry's? You can literally get an, an Amazon.com, you get a little button and you press it and Ben and Jerry's comes to wherever you are. Like, that's pretty awesome. But think about what has to happen for that. So this little device has to connect to the internet, it has to send some order information through to Amazon's version of IoT, and it has to do that for about 50 cents. <coughs> Otherwise, nobody can afford to actually send these damn things out in bulk to all of their end users. So the devices had to get cheap. Um, they had to start talking a common standard protocol. So it's either HTTP or HTTPS. Being able to talk to on an internet language with a broad set of internet provider backbones has gotten rid of all of the grief from the networking side of things. Uh, it's completely opened up all the security problems, but at least everybody can talk. Uh, so that was the, the second thing. Uh, and the third thing was cloud in general. So it's the gateway is, is nice to, to have glued together, but cloud platforms enable people to do bulk transactions at very, very low prices. Um, nobody is going to spend $20 million on infrastructure to find out if people want to buy Ben & Jerry's with a button. Nobody does that. Uh, but if you can throw it out and get it done for tens of thousands, that's worth it. You inherit all of the usual things that we see with cloud platforms. So they're PCI compliant, you can get SOX compliance, you've got no grief like that. Um, they have a huge amount of infrastructure, you don't have to worry about scalability. So all of the usual things you have in any of your web apps. So that sort of stuff is leveraged out of the box. So security, that's probably the, the number one thing that everybody sees at the moment about IoT devices. Um, there's a few reasons that you see it in the news. Uh, it's not the commercial side of things. Uh, obviously, Vodafone's network is inherently secure because it's private. So that you're not going to have to worry about people picking up your IP address and then hammering away with uh, a default set of credentials. The stuff you're seeing in the news is basically an attempt to get product cheap enough to ship out that people will actually buy it. Um, and security is one of the first things that goes as soon as you've got to get cheap. And that's not different from any other piece of IT infrastructure. Um, if you're trying to get something produced in the dollars, uh, you can pretty much forget the chance that it's going to be secure. Uh, the other part of the problem is it is targeted at the home or the, the, the consumer market and most of the people who are going to use that device have got no idea whatsoever what they're doing. So it all comes with default credentials. It doesn't trouble you to change them when you install it. Uh, because they don't want to create any barrier to utilization. So you've got a cheap widget that nobody secured, and then they couldn't be bothered making it difficult for you to use. It's pretty much a recipe for disaster as far as security goes. So uh, I think we need to understand the security for the IoT mainly, and also for our platform obviously, is a joint responsibility between uh, these roles that I can see, that I can think of, or probably if I miss one or two, please let me know. But I can think of the IoT hardware manufacturer, like uh, what you say, the one dollars devices, twenty dollars devices. Surely, uh, uh, there's not much security happening there. And then, uh, then what happens is, um, if you think about security, you're thinking about the threats. So, if you're thinking about the threats, you're thinking about uh, how do we attack it? Uh, what, what, what is the attack factors? And if you already think about the attack factors, then you can think of how to mitigate this. So, uh, so what happens is, um, once you understand that they, they're a potential threat because of the one dollar devices, um, probably not so really secure, a username, admin, password, admin maybe. So we think of uh, when you start connecting it um, after the stack, and well, when you start building a solution, um, you're a solution developer, for example, you start thinking how are we going to build a solution with the security in mind, so how are we going to secure these devices. Right, so because we don't know that the, uh, the, uh, the product might be manufactured somewhere else and we don't know how, how to secure this, then we need to understand how to mitigate this and how to secure the platform. And the cloud and solution developers, uh, the guys from the Strut, uh, is cloud solution developer, they, are, they understand uh, how to uh, start developing the solution securely, obviously with the security in mind, and that's their responsibility as well. And, uh, and the rest of the uh, integrator and also the, manage, the management of the solution. Probably some of the, the, the simplest things that people should consider when it comes to securing devices, uh, uh, which they don't, is yes, it needs to be on the internet. Uh, no, it doesn't have to be listening on the internet. Um, and, and the vast bulk of all of these issues could be very simply solved if people designed the software to work in a polling manner instead of listening. So people get a device, 
it has to be configured in some way. Um, but from that moment on, it should not listen on a public address. They're too small and they're too simple to run things like firewalls. It's just not feasible. They don't have the compute power, and when they do have the compute power, then they don't have the battery power to be able to run it. So to keep battery utilization and CPU low, they don't have firewalls, they don't have malware protection, uh, they just basically cannot do the highly secure functions that we need them to do. But if the device can only call out, at least you know nobody's going to pick you up on the internet and call in, like they usually do and hack your device. So that would be like the number one thing our industry could do at the moment to increase security. Everything should be outbound. So if it needs to get an update, it has to go fetch it. It can't listen for that update. That would solve a lot of our problems. Um, probably not going to get done any time soon, so it just for the end. Now, um, this is one of the uh, reference architecture that I lift uh, from, the, uh, from the Microsoft side. Uh, when you start thinking of the, uh, designing the uh, security architecture in, a, uh, in, in your IT solutions. So basically the principle is, um, uh, I don't know if you heard it, this is uh, not trust zone. So basically we don't trust anyone, including our internal networks. Uh, Google is also doing this as well. So why? So then the, the approach is different. When you start thinking of assume that you've already been breached or assume that you've been hacked, so what happens is what you're trying to do is you, instead of you typically uh, treat your security zone in enterprise, you have your DMZ and then you scale with firewalls and, and such. Uh, but uh, what, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, analyze using a uh, threat modeling. Uh, I did mention that before. Uh, it, a lot of people have a different uh, methodology or different technique how to model the threats. Uh, what I use usually is TRI, which is as for spoofing, uh, uh, T for tampering, R for repudiation, information disclosure, de denial of service. Um, so uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to localize and put this in, uh, in, on, in every single uh, zone. Is basically we do a threat uh, modeling in every single zone. So what happens is once you, you've done that, so this is the, the way you design your solution. So once you uh, do a threat modeling in every single uh, zone or every single uh, uh, potential uh, threat attacks there, then you think of uh, how to actually build a solution or how to mitigate the, uh, the attack factors. One of the number one things that people want to do with all the inbound data is basically the processing. Uh, in the past, you just the cost was too high to try it out. Uh, so if you're on VMware and physical kit and all the rest of it and using colo data centers or anything like that, nobody wanted to make that sort of investment unless there was a really good chance of a return. Uh, one of the services that pretty much one of the first services that gateways like Amazon IoT is going to give you is access to compute. So once all that data is coming in, if you want to get the analytics or answers or actions out of that, it's just cheap entry points to compute. Okay. Um, so, uh, thank you. <laughs>